Welcome. My name is Mwende Inohosa, and I am the Director of Communications and Strategic Storytelling here at the Law Center. And it is my honor to welcome you to today's workshop, which is about radical home ownership. Um, my colleagues, Chris Tittle, Janelle Orsi, and Dorian Payan will be facilitating. And we will also have some special guests from Segorite Land Trust and East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative. Um, before I get in a little bit further, just wanted to say this workshop was originally advertised as an hour long, but we have so much great information and want to engage in so much dialogue that we're actually going to add 15 minutes to the end for small group conversations. So if you can, please stick around and um, share if you can. And we're really sorry if this adds any issues to your to the event but um, yeah so the event today um how can people liberate themselves from the unfortunate predicament of private property ownership while deepening the relationship to home and community this is the kind of question that we're going to be um, using today um, in the workshop and um yeah, before we get started too, I just want to say that all the cartoons that you see today are going to be cartoons by Janelle, Erica Sato, Molly Keller, and Asan Sadehi. Um, additionally, if you need ASL interpretation, uh, please pin the screen of Xavier Kaler. Um, thank you, Xavier, for your help today. And um, you will be able to um, see Xavier throughout the workshop. One last thing before we move forward. Um, this workshop is actually part one of a two-part series on radical home ownership. And it's part of a larger week of um, events that we're calling Radical Real Estate Week. Um, so if you have any interest in um, future events, um, you can click on a link. I'm imagining somebody um, will be dropping in, in the uh, chat and um, Let's see, next, so tomorrow, part two of the event uh, of Radical Real Estate Week is actually the legal tools for radical home ownership that Janelle will be presenting. And um, this is also good for MCLE credit. That's tomorrow at 4 p.m. And our uh, culminating event for Radical Real Estate Week is the history of land grabs and how to fight back. That will be Thursday at 1230 and we have tons of great speakers from APEN, Friends of the Earth, Minnow, EB Prec, and Segorite Land Trust, so many more people. Um, so yeah, uh, before I hand this off to uh, the facilitators, I just want to say if you find yourself speaking or asking a question, during today's workshop, please make sure to speak slowly so Xavier can interpret for us. So um, now I just wanna pass it to our facilitators. Thanks. That's you, Dorian. Okay. Um... Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dorian Payan. I use he and they pronouns and I'm a legal apprentice here at the Law Center's Radical Real Estate Law School. Um, so we have the agenda on hand for today. We'll start with, uh, you know, what is radical real estate? Go into racialized housing inequality, the nuts and bolts and puzzles to untangle. Go through some stories, a Q&A, a community conversation. Um, that will actually be moving towards the end, the breakout groups. And then um, going forward, what steps we'll be wanting to take next and uh, resources that we can offer or what we'd like to plug into. Um, if I can get on the next slide. So I wanted to take a moment to bring everyone in today, you know, just disengage with Zoom World for just a second and come outside of the screen take into consideration where you find yourself planted today and where the walls that shelter you have been erected. Um, I've dropped a link here or I'll drop a link here in the chat um, for those who would like to know where they stand today to do so. 
Um, we can move on to the next uh, slide. So this is a website that tells you whose land we're on. Uh, for us at the Sustainable Economies Law Center, though we encompass many geographies, uh, our, our physical hub is standing on Huichin, Checheno speaking, Lishjan Ohlone land. Uh, we remain grateful for the way that this land has sustained us and we remain vigilant in never allowing us to forget that our presence today was facilitated through land theft and, and genocide. Our analysis of anything mentioning the word radical today will remain incomplete if we fail to acknowledge that uh, this world calls us to be thorough and, and foundational in our healing. So to dig into the root of our ailments and, and really start from there. Uh, if I could get the next slide. So while at our radical real estate law school, we're learning to navigate the legal webs that tie us all together. We're also actively seeking to animate the laws with an ethic of, of rematriation. Uh, so rematriation moves us beyond the land as an object. If I can get the next slide. Because land is actually not an object, right? It's not something that you can pick off of a shelf. Uh, shout out to Janelle for this amazing illustration here that displays that. Um, can we move on to the next slide? Um, and because land is not a thing, you know, this concept of rematriation really stands into contrast to what the term repatriation has has covered when we think about, you know, relationships with with indigenous people in this land. So in the past, for example, this country has repatriated, meaning given back uh, artifacts and, and um, the bones dug up of ancestors that belong to indigenous communities here um, and people also which is also a very necessary thing to do. Um, but because land is not an object that you can repatriate and land is actually a relationship. Um, if I could get to the next slide, please. Uh, this is, this is uh, where we actually engage with our humanity, right? This is where we live. This is where we eat. This is where we exist. And, and this is uh, why we use the word rematriate. So to rematriate, you know, think of, of mother in the root is, is to give life back to the land. And you do that best by reestablishing the relationships that existed here. Um, we can all learn how to relate to the land in better ways, and we can definitely feel connected to the land we live in. But we also need to acknowledge that there is a relational wisdom on this land that, that precedes us. And that wisdom was cultivated through deep listening, through, uh, uh, you know, for millennia by, indigenous people. And listening, of course, is not exclusive to the ear. To listen is to pay close attention. And those deep listeners are still with us here today. So if we wanna heal a relationship with the land. We need to make sure that we're making way for them to be in right relationship with it. And we need to follow. We also need to make sure that we ourselves are also in the practice of deep listening. Um, so I invite everyone into deep listening today. Deep listening allows us to point to the places where it hurts. And it allows us to begin the process of, of really deep healing. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to my coworker and mentor, Chris Nell. Uh, Thank you so much for that, Dorian. And greetings, everyone. I'm Chris Tittle. I'm the Director of Land and Housing Justice at Sustainable Economies Law Center uh, and also became an attorney uh, without going to law school like um, Dorian is striving for at the moment. I'm calling in from uh, Edisto Natchez Cousseau lands, otherwise known as Charleston, South Carolina. And as Dorian points to, we believe that home as a source of safety, belonging, shelter, as a source of relationship to place and to life is a fundamental human right. But homeownership as practiced in the US in particular is an economic and political construct uh, and one that's deeply tied to the projects of capitalism, settler colonialism and white supremacy. So I'm gonna try to break that down just a little bit through five things about private homeownership and racial capitalism. So I actually grew up in an essentially all white neighborhood. Even though I went to one of the most racially and ethnically diverse public school systems in the country, 
you know, I benefited tremendously from that diversity in my public schools. But why when nearly half of my classmates were people of color or um, non-native English speakers, was there only one black family in my entire neighborhood? This is a basic fact about US housing. It is designed for segregation. And this has a long history. In fact, since the violent overthrow of reconstruction in the 1870s, both public policy and the private market have enforced racial segregation from the Jim Crow Black Codes to the Housing and Urban Development Act in the 1970s to the Trump administration's repeal of the affirmatively furthering fair housing policy just earlier this year. To take just two specific examples, um, single family zoning. So in the early 1900s, it was in fact quite common for cities to have explicitly racist zoning laws that prohibited black people and other people of color from living in certain neighborhoods or prohibited white people from selling a home to a black person. This was eventually ruled unconstitutional, but that immediately gave way to what is still the most ubiquitous form of residential zoning, which is ordinance, ordinances that limit neighborhoods to single family homes. So while these laws don't mention race, they actually have the same impact of segregating neighborhoods based on whether people could afford single family homes. And who could afford single family homes? Well, that's where um, the Federal Housing Administration or the FHA comes in. This is an agency created in 1934 as part of the New Deal to ensure home mortgages but only for houses that were well inside the boundaries of white neighborhoods. This is what we now understand as redlining, where federal policy would only back uh, home mortgages in specific neighborhoods that excluded black people. So in subsidizing the wealth creation for white families and explicitly denying it to black families, policies like this shaped our communities in ways that we are still very much dealing with the types of targeted disinvestment in predominantly black neighborhoods have created the conditions for the current onslaught of gentrification, just for an example. So in the Bay Area, as new people and new capital pour into the community, we're actually seeing a kind of reverse migration back into racially segregated rural uh, and suburban communities. So that brings us to the second point. Uh, next slide, please. So, you know, other than being just morally wrong, what's the big deal with segregation? Well, it's at least in part because segregation enables wealth extraction and accumulation. So I recently became a homeowner myself. I have to confess, uh, after leaving the Bay Area to move back south where my family lives, my wife and I bought a home in, in a historically Black neighborhood that was already and advanced stages of gentrification. And now the people we bought it from sold it to us after only living there for two years. And they realized a 40% profit for doing nothing at all, but living in a neighborhood that had had artificially depressed home values because it was largely black. So that's another statistical pattern. Um, a Brookings uh, study sh recently found that homes in majority black neighborhoods are valued at roughly half the price as homes in neighborhoods with no black residents. And likewise, uh, homes in, of similar quality in neighborhoods with similar amenities are worth 23% less in majority black neighborhoods. In other words, on average $48,000 per home less amounting to over $150 billion in cumulative losses for people who simply live in majority black neighborhoods. White homeownership has you know, stayed relatively consistently around 70% for almost 50 years, while black homeownership has actually never surpassed 50% in this country, meaning that a majority of black people have always been renters and basically had their um, money extracted out by white landlords through monthly rent. So whether they rent or own a home, people living in predominantly black neighborhoods have wealth extracted from them or denied to them because of both public policy and private market actors. 
And as a result, the racial wealth gap is worse now than it was in 1963. Uh, remember that this is a wealth gap. And so wealth disparities are actually three times greater than income disparities, which are also a driver of that gap, of course. What is one of the most primary sources of wealth for most Americans? Well, it's home ownership. So that takes us to our third point, which you've, you could probably already guess in a sense. But as mentioned earlier, the federal government has long subsidized home ownership for white people. Again, my family is no different than that. Um, we benefited from subsidized home ownership and education through programs like the FHA and the GI Bill, which used those same redlining standards to ensure home mortgages for white veterans while locking out black veterans. My parents had already owned uh, and sold multiple homes by the time I was born. And so they had access to wealth building tools that are a direct result of these government programs. Um, likewise, the government still pours over $400 billion a year to support asset development, again, primarily through single family home ownership and is continuing to subsidize wealth, uh, white wealth accumulation while actually penalizing asset building for the poor. And again, the poor are disproportionately black. So for example, most um, social safety net programs like food and cash benefits don't actually allow families to qualify if they have a few thousand dollars in assets, whether that's a savings account uh, or equity in a home. So white uh, home ownership has created a lot of relative wealth and security for white people it has been one of the primary drivers of the racial wealth gap, um, which you can show in that next image. Yeah. Uh, moving on to the fourth point though. So while it creates wealth um, for certain people, it's actually been used as a tool of dispossession for black, indigenous and other people of color. So to take one example that I alluded to earlier, um, if you don't mind clicking Janelle, the 1968 Urban Housing and Development Act um, was a bill that was passed in the context of massive urban uprisings against racism and inequality in 1968. And this act made home mortgages available for only a $200 down payment. It tied mortgage payments to income instead of to the value of the home and it capped the interest rates at 1%. And so all of this was backed by the federal government's guarantee to pay the difference. It sounds like kind of a good thing, right? But of course, what happened wasn't that surprising, guaranteed to be paid back by the government, regardless of whether buyers could actually afford it. Real estate agents and banks colluded to sell uninhabitable, sometimes even condemned homes to poor black families at inflated prices. And when they couldn't pay the mortgage off, Banks would foreclose, collect the principal from the federal government, and then turn around and sell it to another poor black family. Um, in the words of Kianga Yamada Taylor, who uh, is a great scholar on these issues, she says, as a result, the nation's first programs to encourage black home ownership ended in the 1980s with tens of thousands of foreclosures and turned into a gold mine for real estate agents and mortgage lenders. That's one example. Um, uh, there's, there's numerous others, including heirs property laws, the very nature of property laws themselves, which have enabled um, land grabbing, particularly in the South. Today, proportionately fewer Black people own homes than when segregation was actually legal. That sort of tells it all right there. And of course, the, the 2008 subprime mortgage crisis um, which disproportionately target people of color with subprime uh, or otherwise known as predatory mortgages was the greatest loss of black wealth in modern US history. So in promoting certain forms of home ownership uh, for black communities, um, it's actually been a driver of, of wealth loss in a lot of cases. Also worth mentioning that as homeowners, my family lost a lot of wealth in that housing collapsed too, as did millions of people. So the a system enabled by white supremacy actually hurt everyone with the exception of the super wealthy, of course, who profited from those people's loss. 
And so lastly, it's my belief at least that there is no way to abolish the racial wealth gap without also transforming housing under capitalism. Single family home ownership in particular, is one of the main pillars of racialized wealth inequality, despite um, the mythology of home ownership as part of the American dream. Both the private market and public policy have colluded together to reinforce an economic and social order that has over centuries now tended to reward whiteness and prey on blackness. And with that in mind, I think it's the responsibility of those of us who have benefited from uh, those centuries of dispossession to play a key role in transforming racialized wealth inequality. As homeowners, perhaps we have a maybe a special responsibility, but also an opportunity to step in in this moment, both through um, perhaps personal acts of reparations or rematriation, as well as collective actions to change the rules and spread wealth more equitably in society. So that's a tall order. I'm guessing that's probably what brought a lot of you here tonight. We don't have all the answers for that, which is why we're, we're starting a series of conversations on this. Um, but we do have some initial thoughts, at least on the mechanics of it. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to my coworker, Janelle Orsi. Hi, everybody. Um, I don't know if I've ever seen such a large turnout in RSVP for one of our events. Um, I think we got 275 RSVPs, which just tells me that a lot of people are coming to the conclusion that we need to rethink home ownership, And that's so beautiful. And I'm really glad you're all here. And this question of how is a really big one. And it, yeah, we are just at the beginning of this inquiry of just how do we begin to shift the use, the benefit, the control, the stewardship, and ultimately the legal ownership of real estate from this private model toward communities that are focused on rematriation and reparations. So tomorrow, we're going to talk a lot about how from particularly from a legal perspective, which is our specialty here, but it's also just one part of a many layered um, set of challenges and inquiries, but I hope you all will join us tomorrow at 4 p.m. And in the meantime, I'm going to give a short overview of how we're thinking about things, and I like to use metaphors. So today, I want to say it's helpful to think about our homes as butterflies. And the reason for that is that well, butterflies bring us joy, they nourish ecosystems, they cross pollinate. And similarly, our homes are things of infinite value to communities. Like there's no limit on the value that our homes and properties can provide to the people around us, to the beings around us, just depending on how we decide to use them and who's deciding to use them. Uh, but what tends to happen is that the, the infinite value of homes really gets washed out because what we ultimately tend to do is box up our homes and sell them on a market that's really only looking at one thing, which is the measurable monetary value of our homes. And so that's why one of the most important or sets of legal tools for radical homeowners are tools that help us remove housing from the market, the speculative market, permanently. And it's surprisingly challenging to do that. So that's a lot of what we're gonna talk about, but there's also a lot of things that we can begin to do in between to just have communities take part in the stewardship and the use of our homes. So building on the metaphor, happy Halloween. The speculative market is extremely scary and so is our legal system, but we're gonna work with it. Um, and so one of the things to note is that homeownership is really bound up in a really complicated web of laws that almost make it inevitable that homes are going to get uh, over and over again swallowed up by the speculative market. And it was convenient to use a spider as, a, as the metaphor, but now I have to apologize to spiders everywhere because spiders are actually kind of reasonable. They're part of balanced ecosystems. The speculative market is actually way, way creepier than actual spiders because what we have is companies that are gobbling up homes everywhere and then companies that gobble up those companies and then other companies that are gobbling up them and Blackstone for example has um, just in the last recession bought 13,000 
homes in California. So it's rapidly grabbing up lands. And again, shout out to our Thursday event on the on the subject of banning land grabs. So, so we're very motivated as sticky and entangled as these legal questions are, we're really motivated to start working on these legal issues. And I just drew out some of the uh, legal entanglements that are most directly applicable to radical homeowners, homeowners who are really starting to rethink the use of their home and the ownership of it in the long term. And some of these are laws that are actually written into our books that we need to go and change, like land use laws that really limit what can happen on our properties, who can live there, and so on. But some of the laws are not actually, or some of the legal issues are not laws on our books. They're actual contractual provisions in contracts that we have very little power over, such as mortgages and homeowners insurance policies. Um, and just a flag, there's really in, deep, deep in our legal system is a prioritization of the so-called alienability of property. And that's literally the word that we see all over our laws is our laws really want us to be able to alienate property, meaning pick it up and sell it and move it around. Um, this is actual language from the California code. It's so ironic. It says it's a basic resource of the people of the state and it should be freely alienable, alienable. And I feel like we got it exactly wrong. But basically what this means is that any of our attempts to kind of put a restraint on alienation of land and not let it be freely marketable is considered suspect by our legal system. So we have barriers to overcome to make this possible. And so Sustainable Economies Law Center, particularly now that we've launched the Radical Real Estate Law School and we're growing our team and working on a lot of different issues, we're slowly starting to untangle threads from different angles through different projects and programs and partnerships with clients. Um, and so in blue, I kind of indicated some of the kind of work that needs to be done, including legislative advocacy. But like, for example, if, if mortgage loan agreements are one of the biggest restraints on what we can do with our homes, then we need to build a whole new finance sector. And that is some of the work that we're working on here. But as you can see, it's a, it's a big project. Um, it's a lot of fun, but it is big. And just one other shout out to another event, November 19th at noon, save the date, we're having a conversation about liberating land use, which is about, I think land use laws are one of the biggest barriers to radical home ownership in the sense that they are, they really confine how we can view and use our homes. So stay tuned for that. But of course, the legal issues are only one layer of this entanglement. And there are a few other layers I'm just going to mention because th this is where everyone else here comes in, lawyers and non-lawyers alike, <coughs> excuse me, is that there's economic layers, the biggest of which is just that we tend to treat our homes as nest eggs and half of Americans don't have savings. And so there's, this is one of the most intractable questions that comes up for people is like, my home is my sole source of economic security. What's gonna sustain me throughout my lifetime? And of course, these are all things that we need to be addressing. And this is why Sustainable Economies Law Center, if you go to our website, we're a very eclectic organization because we're really trying to answer the question from a lot of angles of just what's gonna sustain people. And so we build a mutual aid movement and cooperatives and um, rethink savings as a tool of financial security and so on. So we're working on this, but we all need to be building that, that new economy. There's of course cultural layers because so many of the images that we get of what a home is and what we do with it are, are very influenced by, um, by white supremacist images that really prioritize upper middle class nuclear families. And really there's just not a culture of interdependence. Like sometimes asking for help is viewed as a sign of weakness. Um, and so there's that aspect to address. The social and interpersonal layers are very sticky. Um, I don't know if you've ever given something away and then had somebody judge you for being kind of impractical um, or unwise for giving something away, but this is very common. And there's a lot of tensions of people who um, rightfully so are very scared right now and have a scarcity mentality. Um, and we need to really navigate that with our family, with our neighbors, housemates, and so on. And then to that point, it's also, it's, there's emotional and spiritual layers because we're going to default again and again to the scarcity mentality and the fear that really makes it hard for us to kind of 
surrender to our inter interdependence with others. But I think with practice, we can begin to find liberation and satisfaction in doing something different. So lots of layers, but let's imagine we get through those layers and we free our homes to do something different than now what? So if, if private ownership is no longer the thing that determines our homes and their futures, then it should be the community. But then the community, what shape does it take? Um, I'm using the phrase stewardship organizations here to refer to really all kinds of organizations. Many of them may be called land trusts. Some are real estate cooperatives. So groups of all kinds. It could just be community organizations that we have relationships with. Um, in our in our local communities uh, but whatever they're called i think there's a few critical elements that we need to be looking for um, which is one is that they spread power they spread control of land and real estate and housing to many infinitely diverse small groups of people who decide what happens on that land and who's involved and how to take care of it that the benefits of the land the wealth spreads to the community as well and that these assets remain permanently rooted in community. And this is one of the hardest parts legally, which is just that the, the gravitational pull of the speculative market is so strong that it's so hard to keep these assets off the market. Um, and just one little note is that as organizations, stewardship organizations like these begin to emerge and begin to spread throughout our communities, and you're gonna meet a couple of them in a moment, these organizations are naturally gonna guide us through these many layers of economic, cultural, social, spiritual, these dimensions, because what we're doing in them is already beginning to practice a new way of life, of collectively participating in the decisions about the things that happen around us and how we take care of land, but also how do we take care of each other. And so that's convenient that it's going to, in creating this, we're going to be able to start to unpack the layers. And what we really need for all of this to work is a whole ecosystem of stewardship organizations, because one organization may not be able to steward a property in perpetuity, but if there are interconnected roots and branches with other organizations and cross pollination among them, then anytime one organization can no longer steward a property, there's probably a whole community of other organizations that can step in. And then you know, we've, once we free our homes from the speculative market and, and start to transfer them to control and ownership by steward organizations, that path that it takes, it could take a whole lot of different paths. And so for homeowners, it really has a lot to do with what are your financial needs, who else is involved, how long will you be living there, um, what's the timeline, are you going to be starting to transfer things now or is it going to be later? And so there's a lot of different tools that can begin to share use, control, ownership uh, with stewardship organizations and the level of, of sharing and the timing of it can vary depending on which tools you use. So that's what we're going to talk about tomorrow. And then in the big picture, we're realizing we really need more stories. Like there are very few stories of homeowners rethinking their relationship to home and doing something like this. And we're beginning to collect stories. I think one person on the call today uh, is Robin Crane, sometimes known as Bean Crane, who with me recently interviewed a homeowner who's planning to um, eventually transfer her property to a land trust and just hearing her story and how she got to that place and how she's thinking about it, but also all the complications and the challenges involved for us really helped to see, wow, this is a very nuanced set of considerations. Um, but what we need is um, really dozens of stories, each of which is probably going to be different with the goal that really everyone have stories of people who are somewhat relatable to them or comparable to their own situation. And one challenge is that homeowners are kind of shy about sharing their stories. They're still getting untangled. Um, and also they don't necessarily want to be put on pedestals as like saviors. Um, and so the way we tell these stories um, is really important. And also the way that we collect them is important. And one thing we realized is just that homeowners in the process of sharing their stories can feel affirmed, feel heard, perhaps even for the first time, because again, this is not a very common thing to do. 
Um, when we also need stories of the stewardship organizations themselves, we need many more of them and we need to have a clear vision of how they work and what they do. And of course, one challenge there is that these organizations are also getting untangled from this mess and they're all their staff are working very hard. Um, and so they're not able to get out there and tell the stories all the time. But just to give you a sense of some of the insights we're gathering so far by interviewing homeowners and organizations and gathering their stories is just that we're starting to get insights into how people are navigating their fears and what are even some of the fears that come up. And I, I realize, you know, I've been thinking a lot about the legal tools, but what about family relations? Like that stuff is really sticky. And um, a person we interviewed just expressed that family members got angry at the idea that she might be giving up some of her wealth some of it maybe because they felt entitled to it but then the other part is they feel like she's now going to become a burden to them so this is really hard um, all kinds of other worries come up around like liability around um, just like the future is so unpredictable like how do we create a plan that we know is going to work well we can't. So even with all these fears, I think what keeps people going is that there's some really deep inspiration driving people. And I'll just share a couple of tidbits. I, the second one here is, well, the first one is just wanting to heal a lineage of exploitation, knowing that for a lot of us, the wealth that we have came from an ancestral lineage of theft and exploitation. And we're you know ready to disrupt that pattern. But also, I think this is especially hard for parents. This is what I have heard is just that, um, yeah, relinquishing to the community what you might have left just to your children can feel very challenging until you realize, well, maybe what's more valuable to children, more valuable than dollars, is having them inherit and learn to depend on a culture of co and community of caring and sharing. Like if that's what they're inheriting, that's infinitely more valuable. So that's some of the inspiration that we're gathering from the stories. And now I want to introduce a couple people from uh, local stewardship organization, <coughs> organizations here in the Bay Area, just so you can get a sense of, of who are the organizations that are set up to partner with homeowners. And um, I think um, we, so we have Ariel Lucky of the Segorite Land Trust, and we have Ojan, Ojan Mobidshahi of the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative. So I don't know if someone's able to pin their videos on there, but um, you know, I threw a few questions their way and they have some slides which you all can just ask me to click through. Um, starting with Ariel. Thank you so much, Janelle. I, um, I'm so glad to be here with everyone um, and a part of this amazing and important conversation. Hi, my name is Ariel Lucky. I use he and him pronouns and uh, I am the development director of Segorate Land Trust um, here in Huchin, uh, the East Bay uh, traditional ancestral land of the Lashan Ohlone. Um, and yeah, I, I'm excited to share just a snapshot um, of, uh, of what we're up to. If you can go to the next slide, that'd be great. I wanted to start with our co-founders and co-directors, um, Karina Le, uh, Gould and Janella LaRose. Karina is on the left-hand side um, and she is Lashana Ohlone. She can trace her um, family, her ancestral home here in Oakland in the, in the greater East Bay um, back to pre-Spanish contact. So her family has lived on this land for hundreds of generations. And on the right-hand side is um, Janella LaRose. She is Shoshone Bannock. So her people are from kind of the Idaho area, um, but she's been living in the Bay Area for about 40 years. And the two of them have been doing um, really powerful grassroots organizing uh, throughout the Native American community and the broader Bay Area community for over two decades now, protecting Ohlone sacred sites and responding to all sorts of um, important needs. And so uh, Segorite Land Trust is um, the first uh, urban indigenous women led land trust um, in the country and uh, to facilitate the return of indigenous land to indigenous people. Um, so I wanna uh, point out just a couple quick things. One is that we are on Ohlone land and Karina, Karina is also the spokesperson for the Federated Villages of Lashan, which is um, her Lashan Ohlone tribe. 
And so we are on the traditional land of her people. And Sigorte is also an intertribal indigenous organization because um, the Bay Area has actually one of the largest Native American populations in the country, um, largely because of the Relocation Act. In the 50s and 60s, the federal government was pushing people off reservations um, as a project of assimilation into urban centers. So um, we are uh, led by urban indigenous women and um, part of their inspiration in starting Segorite Land Trust is they realize that many land trusts, the vast majority of land trusts are oriented around kind of conservation of land, uh, wilderness and nature protection um, and a very kind of Eurocentric view of a separation between nature and people. And they also noticed that um, the vast majority of land trusts are run by men, that it's really um, part of this patriarchal um, paradigm. So um, Karina and Janela started Segorite in 2012 and um, to really be a vehicle to reclaim and rematriate uh, Ohlone land in the Bay Area. Um, part of our understanding of rematriation is to restore a people to their rightful place in sacred relationship with their ancestral land. And I would, um, you know, just kind of add to what's already been said in, in the idea that this is very much emergent. This is very much unfolding um, what rematriation is and can be and will be um, is wide and open and deep and, and big. And I think we're just um, beginning or continuing and beginning that process. You can go to the next slide, please. So um, our work at Segorite includes um, many different kinds of programs. We are uh, currently working on three different land sites in the East Bay, growing traditional medicinal plants, um, creating space for ceremony, doing cultural revitalization for um, indigenous ceremony, the Ohlone language of Chochenyo and all sorts of things. And um, the vision is to um, gather and kind of liberate different pieces of land, you know, here in the East Bay and one of the most inflated real estate markets in the country and a very densely populated urban environment. What does it look like to have open space, to have green space, to have space where indigenous women are making the decisions and caring for the land and, and leading the way. Um, part of how we have been able to support this work and specifically engage in the broad community of folks who live here is through something called the Shumi land tax. And Shumi is the Chochenyo word for gift. Chochenyo is the traditional language of this land of the Ohlone people. And um, part of what's so inspiring for me as a non-Indigenous person by um, Karina and Janela's vision is that in many ways they are being incredibly inclusive. They are, they are offering an invitation for everyone who lives here on this land to participate in transforming our relationship with the land, to acknowledging the history of genocide and land theft here and help create a new future for what this community and what this place can look like. And one of the particular um, ways to do that is by participating in the Shumi land tax. You can go to the next slide, which is an invitation for everyone who lives in the East Bay on Lashana Ohlone land to make an annual financial contribution towards this work. And there's a calculator on our website that helps you people think about, do you rent land, do you own land? and then to, to start calculating how much you might be able to contribute. Um, and there's a lot more details and more information about what that looks like on the website. Um, but that is one particular way that we are figuring out um, for folks who live here, who own land or rent land, who are not indigenous to this place to, um, to plug in and support this work of rematriation. We also are in conversation with landowners and homeowners. We um, recently had a couple who owned their home in East Oakland 
put their home in, into their will. They don't have children, so that wasn't part of that conversation. Um, but they worked with their lawyer and they drafted up the language and they met with us and we kind of um, worked out the logistics. And they actually wrote a letter describing their process, their decision making and some of the, the hoops that they jumped through. So that's actually available on our website and I'll, I'll post the link um, into the chat. Um, we're also talking to, there's a woman who lives in San Leandro who has offered the use of her yard space to grow food and her living room to have meetings. Um, there's another person with a house in Richmond um, who were in conversation about uh, transferring that deed. So we are exploring what this, what this can look like logistically and culturally and um, figuring it out. Um, we have lots of questions as well as, you know, how, how can homeowners contribute and participate in rematriation? Um, and we are excited to explore and, and dream together and, um, and kind of create the path as we walk it. Um, we're looking at lots of different legal tools um, and also trying to share the stories like Janelle was talking about. So um, I think I'll stop there, but I encourage you to check out the website and uh, our Instagram in particular. And um, yeah, look forward to being uh, a part of more of these conversations. Thank you so much, Ariel. And we can now hear from Ojan of the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative. Thanks, Janelle. And uh, thank you, Ariel, for presenting around Segorte Land Trust. Definitely uh, one of our big inspirations here at East Bay Prec. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide, Noni, I mean, um, Janelle, sorry. Um, this is just a little bit about who we are. Our staff collective, our original formation was at the top here. Um, with Noni in the center as, as our executive director and some of our other staff members. We were born out of a, a partnership really between Selk, thanks so much Selk for putting on this presentation and inviting us by the way. And um, the, on the bottom right here, you'll see the People of Color Sustainable Housing Network, which was a group of grassroots folks coming together trying to figure out how to find some affordable housing in the area. They partnered with Selk and EV Prec was born, which is a multi-stakeholder cooperative uh, woman and POC led organization. Um, if you go to the next slide. Um, and this is our mission. We're here to facilitate black indigenous people of color and allied communities to cooperatively organize, finance, purchase, occupy and steward properties, taking them permanently off the speculative market. That's really important for us. We're not engaging in the speculative market. We're pulling properties off. And in doing so, we're creating community controlled assets, empowering communities to cooperatively lead a just transition from an extractive and capitalist system into one where communities are regenerative and restorative in all these ways, ecologically, emotionally, spiritually, culturally, and economically. So that's a really like high level of like what we do. It's, it's a whole lot of integrated pieces together. Um, next slide, please. So as you all know, in the Bay Area, this is a map of Oakland, a red lighting map, which is what governments and banks use to decide where to make loans to different people of different skin color. So we're dealing with this legacy of institutional racism um, and it's really alive today in, in how things are, are panning out, right? Oh, thanks, Janelle. So we try to do this work with three main mission pillars. First is land without landlords, really seeing housing as a right, not a commodity. Second is restorative economics. So creating the systems and the tools that we need to redistribute resources and transform uh, a finance system that is racist into one that's builds wealth for everybody and resources for everybody. And our third mission pillar is heal people power. So how do we rebuild the skills and the culture within our community to support one another and create the world that we wanna to see together? Um, next slide. So at EB Prec, um, we have four different types of ownership and we all are in this together. So residents are owners of the cooperative, community members can be owners, staff members and investors can all be owners of the cooperative together. Um, and we have a much longer presentation where you can join where we'll go into all the details about that, but next slide. Um, basically EV Prec is a, a container for all these community owned properties to be together. So if you do one more, Janelle, um, we do this in a lot of different ways and a lot of ways you can get involved, which include community organizing. You can join and become a community owner. 
Um, we also take sort of radical loans and investments through becoming an investor owner. So this is a way that folks with wealth or even folks without a lot of wealth, each share is $1,000. Folks can buy in uh, and get, you know, a, either you can opt to get a zero uh, return on your investment, 0% dividend or 1.5% dividend. And then finally, if you'll give me one more, Janelle. Um, we also like, you know, we, we acquire properties in a lot of different ways, but we do take property donations. Um, and if you have a property that you think would be interested in working with this model, you can look at our intake form online and, and let us know some more information. Um, if you go to the next slide, Janelle, um, I just wanna show you a few of our, our recent and upcoming projects. This property on the top left is a single family home in Berkeley that was donated to us. And there's a dance studio on back. The, the homeowner was a long time dancer, raised her kids in this house and they've all moved on. They've already gotten their inheritance. So she decided she doesn't want this to just go on the market when she dies. Um, she wants it to be dedicated as a house, a collective house for dancers um, who are gonna be able to use that dance studio in the back to do their work and their passion. On the right, we have a multifamily property, a four unit building um, with affordable uh, rents whose residents came to us when the building was going up for sale. And we partnered with a land trust to buy this property. And then on the bottom left, we're also looking at mixed use properties. So um, this is gonna be a cultural um, hub actually in West Oakland, this historically black cultural corridor. Um, Esther's Orbit Room has been shut down for like 10 years and we're gonna be revitalizing it and um, bringing black led cooperatives to hold down the cultural spaces downstairs um, and have cooperative housing upstairs. If you go to the next slide, I know we're quick on time. So that was a quick teaser. Um, you can learn more at our website and we have online orientations every first and third Tuesdays at lunchtime and in the evenings. And there's my email if you wanna follow up there too, but I know we've got some, maybe some time for questions, but thank you so much, everybody. Deep gratitude to both Ojan and Ariel for sharing your important work. Um, and for all y'all that are interested in hearing from more land stewards, um, please join us on Thursday at 12.30 Pacific, 3.30 Eastern for our panel and fishbowl discussion on the history of land grabs and how to fight back. We now have just a few minutes for um, some Q&A. So um, if Ojan and Ariel don't mind sticking around, um, if you have questions, please pop them in the chat. I'll, I'll do my best. Um, but to start, um, for either of you, maybe, maybe particularly for Ojan, um, several folks asked, I think, a really important question. Does this conversation look different when the homeowners are Black? Do we have examples of Black radical homeowners? Um, and, and perhaps similarly, um, how does one talk with family who have been the ones whose labor have been exploited and who have escaped those cycles of exploitation through, through land ownership? Yeah, that's not an easy question. Uh, thanks for that, Chris. Thanks, everybody. There's, I mean, there's a couple answers to this. Um, one is to say that, you know, the EBPREC model is not necessarily the best model for everybody, right? We definitely recognize there's a need to redistribute wealth. Um, but we also recognize that like, you know, massive wealth loss has come, has impacted the black community in particular through foreclosures in the last financial crisis. So, you know, we recognize that, you know, front, black and indigenous communities are on the front line of these things. And it's somewhat problematic to say, you need to be the first ones to donate your house as well. So that's certainly not always going to be the right choice and not the answer or the expectation. So I just really want to hold a lot of compassion there and to say that like this is an opportunity for folks with um, more income and more historical wealth to give um, in order to create collective wealth, whether it's through Segorite or EB Prec, um, so that we can steward these assets for the community to build wealth in these frontline communities. Um, there's definitely other ways to partner with us besides like giving your home if your home is your only you know, safety net, you don't have to just give it away. Um, I'll also say that, you know, another perspective on this is to say that, you know, class mobility is not really a thing anymore in late capitalism. And more than the security of having a home, we could see the security of having a community that is intact and has resources and to have community who you can rely on is gonna be more important than having 
you know, financial resources in some of the possible futures that we might be coming to with climate change um, and real, real social change that's going to be coming. So while I know it's much easier and more secure to focus on our financial resources as our safety net, um, that's really a system that only functions under our current like political and social paradigm. And that paradigm is not gonna last forever. And in fact, if we can move our resources in the direction to rely on other forms of capital, social capital being as important or more important than financial capital, it's definitely a leap of faith, um, but it's in line with the higher truth that I, I believe in anyways. Beautiful, thank you, Ojan. Um, unfortunately, we are running rather short on time. Uh, and again, just an invitation to those who can stick around. We're gonna have 15 minutes um, for community conversation in small groups. Um, we, we may not get to all the questions in the chat, but please keep them coming because we are tracking these uh, as an organization and figuring out how we can continue to respond. There was a question about um, the investor owner piece of EB prac, maybe Ojan, if you could share in the chat box, just the, the orientation sessions that people could come to for more. And there's a question about deed restrictions that can limit the rate at which home values can grow over time. Maybe tune in tomorrow for our part two conversation where we'll talk more about um, legal tools like that. Um, I don't know if Ariel, if you have any other final thoughts before we kind of move to our, our next piece. I would just say, um, I think to, to, to kind of reiterate what Janelle was talking about earlier is that um, there's a lot of this work that is about finances and the law and the you know, political systems that we are a part of. And I also think a really important part of this process is about our cultural relationship to the land that we live on, the way we talk about it, the way we think about it, the way we relate to the plants and the animals and the earth and all of those things. And so, and the stories that we tell about, you know, you see land acknowledgements happening more, you see people, you know, learning a little bit more about the histories of the land and, and the indigenous communities here. So I, I just, I'm so um, excited to be a part of this process with you all. And I encourage everyone, we have to, we have to like work on all of these different layers, right? Cause we got to get in the courts and the legislation and the contracts and all those things. And there's also a spirit to this work um, that is about reclaiming our humanity and our participation in a, in a community that is on a piece of, of earth. That is, I think also, at the heart of what this is all about. Yes, thank you for that. And I will pass it to Dorian and Janelle, I believe, you know, point us forward. Yeah, before I pass it to Dorian, um, I'm gonna share that there are other projects that have emerged or are in the process of emerging that are asking similar questions. There have always been you know, land justice groups and people advocating for land reform, but now there's some projects emerging that are really speaking to the holders of the wealth, owners of land and wealth, and how they can participate in finding right ways to return land to community stewardship. And so, although he couldn't be here, Cooper Freeman is launching a project next year to create a kind of a toolkit for landowners wanting to engage in rematriation and reparations. And so you can snag his email address here if you want to find out more. So that's the Rightful Return Project. And if um, Robin Crane wouldn't mind unmuting themselves. So Robin, as I mentioned, is someone we're collaborating with a little bit on gathering stories, but can share a little bit about resources from resource generation. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Yeah, I know we don't have too much time, but quickly, I think the role that resource generation could maybe play in the larger ecosystem um, is particularly that layer of interpersonal and also spiritual um, shiftings that need to happen in order for this movement to grow. So, 
yeah, people doing their inner work in order to learn how to organize their families more. This is particularly for people who are young, so under 35 and have access to class privilege or sort of come from those worlds and want to do that redistribution work in a good way. So yeah, my contact info is here. And if people have questions about that or sort of on the peer to peer, how do we get moving in the community scale as the structural shifts are happening, um, people have questions about that. I'm definitely available to, to talk. Thanks so much, Robin. And we only have Xavier, our interpreter, um, until right now. So I want to thank you, Xavier, for your amazing job. Um, so you're free to leave whenever. Um, just one more note. And then for those who want to stay, we have a fun breakout conversation. Dorian, do you want to say anything about what's next for our work? Yeah, yeah, just to echo that this is an ongoing conversation and that we're all here learning together. So I appreciate everyone being here in the space. I've dropped a survey down in the chat where we can both share resources and um, come into conversation with you all, see in what ways we can potentially collaborate with others to um, keep this work going. Uh, that's all I needed to say. Yeah, so if you'd like to take a look at the chat that I dropped below, we'd appreciate it if you filled it out at uh, the survey, I'm sorry. Thanks all. Yeah, your responses will be really helpful because we know that this is a really important project to work on. We don't necessarily know what our role is yet and what all is needed yet, but we know we want to work on it. So we'd love any input if you don't mind clicking on it right now. And then I'm going to, oh, before we pass it on to Chris to facilitate some fun breakout conversations, also want to just put in a plug. If you found this inspiring, we're only able to do this project because we get donations. Like the unrestricted donations we get are the things that allow us to be creative and to sense the needs of communities and to put on workshops that we've never put on before. And so if you have resources that you can contribute, you'd be supporting us in carrying this project forward. So. Chris. Great, and thanks again to everyone who joined us. Um, for those who can't stick around or are not interested in conversation at this moment, that's totally fine. We appreciate your presence for the first hour. You're free to carry on with your lives. For those who are interested in continuing to go a little bit deeper with others here, uh, we have the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes where we're going to offer some small group breakout opportunities to connect, uh, reflect, and share a little bit more. You know, because breaking our addiction to capitalism and home ownership is a team effort. And um, the first step for many of us in working through the cultural and emotional elements of this is really a chance to share our stories and to listen to where others are at in their journeys. And so, um, and just a moment for those who are still here, um, we're going to put you into small groups of, of uh, probably three. And it's an opportunity to take about 10 minutes in your small group to each have a moment to share um, either whatever's come up for you over the last hour or responses to any of these questions that are on um, the slides and in the chat. So what is your vision for liberating or rematriating land and what's your role in that? And also what questions or fears come up for you? What's needed to support your vision? So we're gonna break you into small groups. We're gonna ask you to, to self-facilitate and really to practice the type of listening that Dorian started us out with, um, the deep listening and, and respect of each other's stories. And hopefully you'll have a chance to share your own as well. Uh, once you're in your small groups, if you have a problem, um, 